Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don. You're watching IT Pro TV. Hello, and thank you for choosing IT Pro TV, entertaining IT learning anywhere you go. I'm your host, Zach Memes, for this episode of CEHV10. Social engineering, that's the topic of the hour, and the person bringing us the information we need is the one and only Daniel Lowry. Daniel, good to see you, sir. Hey, Zach, how's it going? It's going really well. I'm, I'm excited to... to move into this, this topic. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Before we get started, what's your mother's maiden name? My mother's maiden name is Carrico. Ah, uh -huh. well, thank you. How do you spell that? <laughs> <laughs> you see? Uh, you see? I saw uh, what he was doing there. Right. That was social engineering. That's social engineering. So yeah. uh, today is all about social engineering. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We are back for more CEHV10. And as my boy Zach has said, and we kind of made fun of, uh, we are going to do a little bit of social engineering today. Maybe you're familiar with that topic, maybe you're not. We're going to talk about some of the basics, and then we're going to move into a little more of the application of that as well. And so that being said, yes. can you further define for us social engineering, please? It, you know, it's it can be a bit of a, a strange piece of terminology, especially for people that are a bit new to what's going on here. And what we mean by when we say social engineering is that instead of hacking a electronic targets, say a computer or a mobile device or whatever, we're actually going to go after the user. That's what we're going to hack. And you say, how do you hack a user? What is this, ghost in the shell? Or, you know, some other crazy, is this data going to come out here? And then, and then we're going to plug a cable into his head and, and get access to his, his neural net? No, no, that's not what we mean. There's nothing wrong with having a chip in your head. That's right. <laughs> that is funny. Because uh, he's inside joke. It's totally true. It is an inside <laughs> joke, and it is hysterical. Uh, <laughs> And if you, yeah, do you, I, I find anybody finds out what that means, I'll be very impressed. <laughs> uh, but what we mean by hacking the user is, is that we are going to try to manipulate them. We're going to use guile. We're going to use deception. We're going to use mm. just about any means necessary in which to get the user to either give me access to something or give me information that they shouldn't. So that's what we mean when we say social engineering. We're going to interact with someone who is in a social context, and we're going to basically use that social context to our advantage. And we're going to prey on the proclivities and the natural um, ways in which people interact with each other to try to get that information, to try to get that access. So hopefully, Zach, and you let me know if that clarified things for you. Oh, yeah. If that, uh, that's what we mean when we say social engineering, okay? So what, what level of damage could a successful social engineering attack cause? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the level of damage is just that of any other type of attack. Mm -hmm. So think of the worst kind of full-on access attack you could think of, and we could have that same level of access through social engineering as we could with uh, some really cool zero-day exploit. The only difference being, really, is that the zero-day exploit requires a high level of skill Social engineering just means you need to be charming. <laughs> and if you can pull that off, you get the same level of devastation towards your client as you would with that high technical use, right? And what's interesting about doing social engineering is, A, a lot of clients don't have the risk appetite for it. They don't, they don't want you to go that route. It's too easy. Yeah, because it's too easy. Remember, you're only as strong as your weakest link, and if your weakest link is the user then that's where you would go. And that's why a lot of clients will say, well, no, leave social engineering off the table. But if you can talk them into, listen, the fact that we need to test how well your uh, you know, end user security training program is working for you and see what information we can get, what kind of access can we get via the human target, always a good idea to push for that. Let, let them know there are a lot of pros to Putting that in, obviously, it does, it's probably going to cost them more money for you to do that level of testing. But the, the, the real reason that they don't want it is because they don't want the black mark on their scorecard. And because it's super easy to get somebody to click on something. Go out there, get in the internet, read all about how effective social engineering is as far as for real attackers to try to gain access or, or get information. It is scary effective, right? So uh, as far as going back to Zach's question as how, how de what level of devastation can we see here? Total annihilation, scorched earth uh, via, or it could just be, I, I learned some usernames and passwords, or, and I, I got minimal access. 
And I could use that and then use a technical. I can chain things together, but it ranges from super low to nothing to complete and utter annihilation of your target. All right. So how does someone pull off a social engineering attack? I mean, I mean, how do you, I, we've talked right, before about right. it. I mean, this, this is just for everybody. How do we pull off these attacks? Yeah, that's, that's the question, right? That's what we're kind of here for today is how do I work with this? Now, we're going to learn some terminology. We have to have some, some basic understanding of what goes into your run-of-the-mill social engineering attack. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I follow a few people that this is what they do. Right? And so I have Twitter accounts and things of that nature uh, where they are social engineers. They don't do the technical aspect of, of an engagement, right? And when you see the ones that are very successful at it, it's pretty crazy. All you have to do is be confident um, and be willing to go in and do and pretend you're, you're basically you're a good actor. If you're a good actor, you'll do well with social engineering. That's, that's a big part of it, is being able to bluff your way through, have the confidence and the bravado necessary to make someone believe you, right? You need to be believable. So that's part of it. The other part of it is the, well, we'll, we'll call it technical aspects of it, right? Knowing what types of, and some of it is actually technical. You will use a computer to engage with social engineering attacks. So there are a couple of ways you could do this. You could do this personally, right? And using those acting techniques uh, where I would come to Zach and say, hey, Zach, what's your, you know, what's your mom? Where are you from? And he tells me, oh, I'm, I'm of Greek descent. I say, oh, cool. You know, well, Memo, so I guess, yeah, that does sound Greek. Is your mom and all that, right? Oh, tells me about his mother. Tells me her maiden name. You know, tell me a little bit about your kids. You know, do you have any pets? And we just start trading stories. So there's this social aspect, hence the social engineering, where we do things personally, face-to-face. -face. But then there's other ways of doing it, which is through electronic means. Maybe I'm going to go through the computer or their mobile device, and I'm going to interact with the user through that medium. Hopefully that makes sense, mm -hmm. okay? So they're going to receive an email. They're gonna receive a text message. They're gonna get an instant message. They're gonna get a voicemail or a phone call or whatever, some way through an electronic medium in which I am going to interact with my target and hopefully getting them to do something like click a link. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. if I can get them to click that link, it's gonna take them to my malicious sites. Then we're gonna get a lot of great action on my end of the spectrum anyway and horrible, horrible action for them. <laughs> because they were the one that did the wrong thing. Okay, I can see. I can see one right now. Hey, it's a great party. Let, let me send you an email so I'll get you all the deets. Yeah, you gotta give me your email. What's your email again? Yeah, boom. Now he's got an email address. He sends, and he actually might send the party email just to keep up the rapport and for further uh, interaction with that end user. But he also might have a spamming server sitting right next to him. Maybe it's in the cloud. Whatever and he's using that to hit that email address. I know there's a good user on the end of this thing, so I'm gonna start spamming. I'm gonna start hitting them with, with different types of email attacks so that hopefully they'll click on something and we'll get uh, some action out of it, okay? So let's see here. Let's talk about some of the tactics that are used. Let's start, yep, at, the, yep, yep, yep. Let's start at the bottom, right? Let's work our way up to the top. So some of the tactics that are used in a successful social engineering campaign are well, they're, they're kind of devious in, in certain ways, right? So let's start with one, uh, authority. This is an attack. You say, how is authority a tactic? If you didn't know who I was, and I came into your business, and I was dressed to the nines, wearing an Armani suit and a gold watch, maybe some, some right? And I seem to know names and places and dates and everything about your business model. And I say, yeah, I'm a silent partner. I need you to help me. I'm looking for so-and-so who works there. Or I need you to do this, I need you to do that. Go open your email, show me, you should have received, well, what, what's this, what's that? Or, another one, I call someone up, I act as, I'm with the help desk, right? I'm with IT, and we are doing some, some cleaning, we've noticed some issues, is your computer giving you any kind of problem? Well, yeah, it is, it runs slow from time to time. Yep, that's exactly what we were looking for. Right. Most people will tell you Dropping that. the name of the owner is kind of cool, too. You know, Mr. Smithson right. said that right. we need to blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you well, know, Mr. Smithson. Yeah, and, and you know, of course, you know Bob, who is the CIO. He heads IT, he does all that. You know, you've probably seen him at the company meetings and such and such. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, we know who that is. Well, you know, I'm a new hire that kind of brought me on to help clean up, make things more efficient, right? 
So we need you to be helpful here. I need to log into your account. Let me get that username and password. Let's get in. Let's make things optimized. Let's get you running. So I'm acting as an authority that they should be listening to. So I use that to pressure them. And of course, I make it very nonchalant. Now, I might not do that. I might have to push a little harder. Some people actually push back when they don't know who you are. They're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that comes down to the crux of what social engineering really is. Social engineering is meant to prey on those social situations and how people react in them. And most people want to be very helpful. They, they don't want to be um, you know, stubborn or, or act like they're in the way or being a stumbling block to uh, efficiency or things getting done. So if you ask them, will you do this? They're both, yeah, of course. You seem to have all the right things. You speak with authority. I'll just do it. But some people are smart, and they'll push back. So you have to use other tactics like fear. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Well, Mr. Smithson, that, that's fine. I'll just tell Mr. Smithson that you declined to help me out. Right. And uh, we'll, we'll move on to another person. Yeah, exactly. Well, what did you, what did you, what did you, and, you know, <laughs> I like the way you put it, actually. And the way he, he uh, presented that was very like, oh, okay, no problem. Yeah. You, you, you're going to be difficult. No, I, I totally understand. I'll get with uh, Mr. Smithson, and he'll get with your boss, and we'll have a sit down so that you understand that when I call, you need to help me out. Yeah, perfect. Right? Absolutely. And you, you should act like, now they're like, Oh, no. <laughs> well, hold, hold, hold on now. It doesn't have to go that far. Yeah. Oh, I mean, if, if you're willing to help me, I'm willing to help you. I'm just trying to get my job done. Yeah, it's, right? it's like we've talked about before that yeah. the number one motivator in human behavior yeah. is fear yeah. of loss. That's right. It is a, is a huge motivating factor, and we can use that to our advantage as a social engineer to get compliance out of them. Right? So, yeah. very, yeah, very yeah, good yeah. one. Another good one is scarcity. So, something is rare then people want to, listen, if you help me out now, I can hook you up later, right? I can get you, the new, when the new laptops come in, I can put your name on that list. And we're only going to get, you know, 30 of them. Uh, uh, you're already, I'm looking at the list right now, and you're not scheduled for an upgrade for your laptop until two more years, right? Oh, but if you, listen, if you, if you let me do this real quick, you know, as a thank you, as a, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours kind of thing. I'll bump your name up that list. It's an easy thing I can do. No one will be the wiser, and we're all good. A lot of people would go for that, right, that there's some scarcity to it, that you're, you're dangling a carrot out in front of them, and you're threatening to take it away. Right? So that could be helpful. Uh, urgency, we kind of hit on this a little bit, that if you don't do this now, the carrot will be taken away, or I'll call Mr. Smithson, or mm -hmm. X, Y, or Z will happen. Right? So... This is urgent. We must make it happen. Just be compliant. Just do what I say. And, and the more urgent you sound, the more urgent urgency they feel. And now I, I, I don't know what to do. Well, just hit the thing. <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. That's all I need. That's all I need. Thanks. You're good to go. All right? Plug this in for me, would you? And you're off. Right. All right. Uh, another couple, uh, one way more, that, uh, or two more, social proof and likeness. So if I come in kind of like, Wearing the suit. I always think of Frank Abagnale when it comes to social engineering because that's exactly what he was. He was a, a master social engineer. He was the guy that they uh, modeled the uh, Catch Me If You Can movie after. Oh, yes, right? absolutely. Uh, right? He would just play the part and people believed him. Great movie. Right? Because he had the confidence. He built his social proof up. So he would wear the right clothes. He would say the right things. He would have all the things. You watch him in the movie and he's, he's learning the terminology of the planes for the pilots so that when he's mimicking a pilot... He's saying all the right things. He has social proof. He's wearing the uniform. He's talking the talk. He's walking the walk. Same kind of thing here, right? And then, of course, that likeness kind of goes along with that. That I look like you, therefore you must be like me, and I'll be compliant. And then ultimately, Frank was employed by the FBI. So yes. It took, a, it took yeah. a thief to catch a thief. <laughs> it did. It did. Uh, you know, that's, that's what he does. That's what he does. He's, he's very successful at that. Not the best way to go about landing a, a federal <laughs> no. job, right? Having to go to prison first was probably not, no, the, best not the best idea. But <clears throat> once he, you know, controlled himself and learned that, uh, you know, we live in a polite society, or at least we should, that, uh, and, and that goes to us as well, right? We're using these skills like Frank is now, not like Frank before, mm -hmm. right? We want to use yeah, our Frank social Frank is ethical skills. now. He's That's like an exactly ethical right. hacker if you go, yeah. That is exactly right, yeah. right? So we're using these skills to help people not to, you know, line our own pockets or, you know, watch the world burn or whatever, okay? All right, let's move on. A couple other ways in which um, tactics that we might use for our social engineering. Some of them are a little more covert, 
than overts when it comes to the social engineering, like getting information. Right? So uh, Zach is actually going to give me information, but he's not going to know he's giving me information. Well, tell, if we do it right every time, he's not going to know he's really giving me information, at least in a bad way. Right? He might know he's handing it out, but uh, <laughs> in these ways, what I mean by covert, though, is I'm going to do things like shoulder circle. Mm -hmm. Zach, I'm just going to kind of come and hang around his office and lean against his cubicle and see what he's up to and see if I can't glean anything interesting. Maybe strike up a conversation with his neighbor and just use that as a smoke screen to get in on his conversation. And it goes into like even eavesdropping. Maybe he's having the conversation and I find myself around him at, of course, I'm targeting him. Uh, uh, he's not just some random passerby. He has information that I want, so therefore he's my target. We don't just kind of go in and, and throw spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. We find out who we need to target, and once we've targeted them, we start putting ourselves in their way, looks, listening, doing the eavesdropping, shoulder surfing. Maybe I can pick up some information that way. Even good old-fashioned, I know this is one of uh, my man Zach's favorite things to do, dumpster diving. Oh, yeah. Right? Go through the trash. Go through the trash. Whether that be an actual dumpster that's outside or just the trash that's at somebody's desk, a lot of great information can be gleaned by just rummaging through their, their garbage uh, because people throw things away that are of importance and they don't think much of it, which kind of like should be making us think of how are we disposing of our garbage? Oh, yeah. Is, is that being done in a secure fashion? So uh, it's always a, a cat and mouse game that we should be thinking uh, I'm looking for these people to employ this. Am I doing the same thing? Am I practicing what I preach kind of stuff? Ultra shred those documents <clears throat> That's right. before you throw them away. That's a, a good idea, right? Uh, plenty of companies will perform that, that service for you. Bring right. a truck right to your building mm -hmm. and start shredding a good bunch of stuff. All right, let's a uh, couple other things. And then, uh, yeah, we, we got time for more stuff. So excellent. USB key drops. Yeah, USB key drops. Probably one of my favorite, as made famous by Mr. Robots. This is awesome. Yeah, so you take a couple of... Actually, it was made famous before that by Stuxnet um, and mm -hmm. a couple other things. But Stuxnet's the one that sticks out in my mind all the time. Um, you take some USB keys. You install malicious software on them that has auto run functionality on it. And then you go out to a parking lot or you... Put them on a card that says, check this out, <laughs> right? Maybe nothing more than that. Here's a free 16 gig, 32 gig, 64 gig, 128 gig USB drive free. Free. You just got to take it. Just take it. If you don't like the software on it, delete it, and the drive is still yours, right? And well, typically this is done by you just take them out of a parking lot and you throw them and you scatter them. Somebody sees a USB key. I actually saw one the other day on a, it wasn't on a bench. It was on like a column that had a little platform with, with bricks that went around the column. Mm -hmm. And there was a USB key sitting there. I was like, huh, uh, oh, no. No, uh, uh, right. But my, my initial inclination was to reach out and grab it. Then I went, oh, no, I'm not plugging that in. Mm -hmm. Right? Because who knows what's on it. But people that aren't security minded, aren't security aware, they will grab that drive, they will take it home, and they will plug it in and go, I wonder what's on here. Because that curiosity in the human mind, right? See, we're hacking the human and not the system per se. Mm -hmm. We're going after that weakest link. They can't help themselves. they got to see what, I wonder what's on here. If anything, I got myself a free drive. Cool. But they plug it in, the malware takes over, it installs, it runs. Now I've got reverse shell access. Yeah. Now uh, it's emailing me information. It's, it's gathering files doing all sorts of automated things, right? That is malicious to the end user. So USB key drops can be super, super. And of course, uh, like I said, it was made famous in Mr. Robot. They use it as an attack against, I think, the police station uh, to gain access to their record system. Oh, well, and also the guy was handing out CDs. Yeah, the, the guy was handing It is another form of yeah. USB key. That's yeah. exactly right. Uh, any kind of medium that they would install or, or plug into their system that could run software of some sort, right? Uh, rubber duckies, it's basically a uh, rubber duck, ducky type software that you put on a USB and they install it. It's just malware. Um, but Stuxnet, that's how it got into an air gap system, which is a nuclear facility, and Ooh. caused damage to uh, their centrifuges in Iran, uh, putting their nuclear program back like by nine months or a year or something like that. That is great. Right? So you think, all I had to do was drop the USB key on the ground and somebody would get it. Okay. 
All right, let's see here. What else can we do? Tailgating and piggybacking. One thing we definitely need to make sure that you guys are aware of as far as the difference between the two, whether it be tailgating or piggybacking, because they're not the same. They're similar, but they're not the same. Okay, and I want to make sure you guys get the difference between the two so that if they ask you a question and piggybacking and tailgating are your options, you know exactly which one to uh, use. So with piggybacking, this is to manipulate someone into helping you go through a security control. Right? It's literally walking through a security area. Right? If you know and, that door for me, I got a bunch of stuff I'm carrying. I can't. That's exactly right. Right. You uh, fully inflate a, bu a bunch of boxes of balloons and you act like they're full of lead. And you're like, oh, hey, buddy, you hold that door for me? And Zach, you know, maybe I've got a, what looks to be a laminate or a, you know, a swipe card if you're using RFID cards or a fob or whatever it is you use. Uh, oh, man, yeah, I, I, thank you so much. And there, again, that human's proclivity to be helpful uh, in that social situation and to be nice is to, yes, oh, let me hold the door. We teach our children when someone is coming out of the door. You hold the door for them, right? So they come out, and then you go through. That is, it, we burn it into our, our brains. That is a good thing, by the way, right? We should be doing that. We live in a polite society. Let's be polite people. That's a good thing. But when it comes to a secure area, we just need to know the difference. If it's just the door to the, to the Ace hardware or whatever, hold it for someone. Let them in. If it's a security area that it takes a badge or a, a punch key or a fingerprint scan or whatever to get through, then you question it. You stop it, right? But that's piggybacking. I, I willfully help. Zach comes up. He's got the boxes in his hands. Hey, buddy, you hold that for me? Oh, yeah, let me hold the door. And he walks right through. I have some sort of complicence, either unknowing, unwittingly or maybe even knowingly, if I'm an inside threat. Right? So that might work itself out that way as well, where I have he has specifically hired me or he's turned me against my company because I'm disgruntled or for whatever reason, maybe he's blackmailing me. It could be a variety of things. And now I'm the inside guy and I'm holding the door to let him go through and I'm being complicit with it, but I'm also kind of on the inside with that. I know what he's going to do, but it might not be that. Now, tailgating is when he's unwitting to the fact that this is happening. Zach... Uh, sees me standing there, maybe tying my shoe or, you know, wadding up some trash and throwing it away. He goes, he swipes, he walks through, he sees my laminate, and I just hold the door and walk right behind him. He might even know, and mostly with tailgating, they don't even know you're there. You are trying to be sneaky. He, you might even let the door shut almost completely and then just slide your hand in there and open it. He thinks you keyed in. He, if he thinks anything at all, if he even sees that it happened, tailgating is typically obfuscated. People don't know that you've done it. You've just slipped in behind them, kind of uh, drafted them, if, if you will, and followed their jet wash into the, into the building. Okay? So that's the difference between piggybacking and tailgating. Make sure you get those right, because if they ask you questions on it, I, make, I, I don't want you to... It's just such a simple thing for you to get right. I'd hate for you to get something wrong on that when all you have to do is make sure you get that little buried seed in your head that this is the way it's going to go. Mm -hmm. Now, Zach, now I'm looking at the clock. It's a little less time than there was when I talked about it before. <laughs> I think this is a good stopping spot for us to uh, pick back up with a part two. Social Engineering Part 1 and Part 2 will be produced, and you will see it. I know it. I can sense it. By the way, see everything that's out of the CEH V10 series. You're going to be so glad you did. Daniel's done a great job putting this series together for you, and it will help you on that exam. By the way, it'll be inside the course library. There's thousands of hours of complimentary information in there designed to do one thing, help you be even more successful. So check that out, too. And tell everybody you know about IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV is binge-worthy. Thanks for watching. I'm Zach Memmis. I'm Daniel Lowry. We will see you again soon. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Vector. We're coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. Hello, and thank you for watching IT Pro TV, helping you learn everywhere you go. I'm your host, Zach Memes, for this episode of CEHV10 Social Engineering Part 2.
And we're going to be asking Daniel Lowry to take us through this again. Aren't we going to do this, Daniel? Yes, we yeah, surely we're, are. We're, we're, we're going to come on just a little bit more. A little, little bit more, right, with the social engineering. <laughs> we laid a really good foundation in the last episode talking about some of the tactics and methodologies and, and uh, ways in which social engineering becomes very yeah. effective and how effective it can be. A lot of great info, info in that. But it was a bit of a, a bit of a blab fest. We do have some things to show in this episode. So and, and we've got quite a bit to go through, so I say we cut to the chase. What do you say? I think we should do that. You know, and, and we last left off with piggybacking and tailgating the Correct. things they are in. What about fishing? Yeah, yeah. Fishing's probably one of the most common ways in which we see social engineering attacks. And you say, so you grab a pole and you go grab, well, the idea, yes, and in reality, not like that. But what we're doing is, is we're going to use email or voice or text or whatever as an electronic format in which to try to bait a hook in some way, shape, or form so that someone will touch the hook and get caught by it. Well, click a link, mm -hmm. right? With phishing, which is pH phishing, what you'll do is you create an email campaign that makes it look like it comes from a legitimate source. So you receive an email in your inbox. Let me give you a for instance. It says, hey, I'm with XYZ company that you use because... Uh, just about 90% of the world uses it, so it's a good bet you use it too. And we've got a problem with your account. If you could do us a favor, would you log in and check your account preferences, make sure everything looks good, make sure there's been no data uh, breach or anything like that. And hey, you can just click right here to click, go to the login page, sign in, access your account, and do all the things we've asked you to do. Hey, well, no problem. And click that link and go in there. Yeah, there's the login, sign in, and I'm off to the races. Everything looks fine. So good. Excellent. All he needed to inform them if there was something wrong. So I'm done. I've done my due diligence. I'm a good user. Mm. You're a good and you, you've been got. <laughs> you've been a good duped user. Yeah, you've been duped. That's right. I like that. A duped user. Right. Right. So uh, this is very common, as I've said. It's a, it's a popular way to do it because people, again, have that thing in their brain that says, it seems... Fishy, <laughs> no pun intended. Yeah. Uh, there's something wrong, but could be right. Uh, it's just a, it's just a link. I'll click on it. No big deal. Big deal. That's how you get malware. That's how you get people stealing information, doing identity theft, things of that nature, because you thought nothing less of clicking on a link. Now, I say that I don't really want to blame my users for this. It's our job as security professionals to inform them and keep them up to date with the things they need to know to stay, stay safe as a user on our system, right, in our organization. So that falls, that onus falls on us to do end user security awareness training. Make sure that they understand that. Now, I, I totally, I've been a part of those programs. I've helped develop them. I've helped implement them. And I totally know that there's a lot of people that just don't care. They just don't care. So we have to work on buy-in with everyone, figure out those ways and getting people to care so they understand that they need to be a part of the solution, not part of the problem, and what could lead, what kind of fallout we would experience if they were to not care at the wrong time. Okay, I, I received two uh, in the past, I'd say, month. One was, should I say the name of the word? Yeah. From? Okay, sure. One was from eBay, supposedly. Supposedly. And one was from PayPal, supposedly. Supposedly. But and, and, and at first, and up front, it looked legitimate. Yeah. But when when I was, and unfortunately for me, I did open one of them. Oh, but, oh no, but, Zachary. But wait a moment. But only to the extent to read what was there. And it was not the format. So you didn't follow any links? No. Gotcha. No. I, you know, it was not the format they typically use. Okay. And one of them I actually even called the company and said, hey, did you send out these emails? Oh, no, no, no. We right. do, you know, that, in fact, we're warning everyone. That is bogus. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's very, very typical, that right there. And actually, Don received a phishing email uh, last week. Mm -hmm. I said, Send that to me so I can use it as an example the next time we talk about social engineering on the show. Guess what? Got it right here. Holy moly! Here it is. This is an actual real-life phishing email that we uh, received, or Don did anyway. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice here we have the subject, action required, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And But if you look at everything about this, this looks very legitimate. It does okay? look legit. Yep. Incoming message delivery failure notification at outlook.postmaster. That. Now that's interesting. Now that's interesting. So these are the kind of things that we need to be able to pick up on to look for to see, is this a social engineering uh, attempt? Is this a phishing email? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Remember, pH fishing. Uh, and that fact that that is dot cat, that rings red flags to me. Oh, yeah. Right? So I, w- I, would, I would probably think this is a phishing email uh, based off of that. But I might have just as easily skimmed across that with my eyes and not seen that that said dot cat and thought it said dot com. We must be very, what's the word? Uh, cautious. Uh, cautious, but be looking, overtly looking for those, those little flags that will tell you this is a problem. Sleuthing. Yes. All right, so it says, uh, subject, action required. Your message was not delivered from the following recipients. And then it doesn't give a recipients list. So that's another weird thing. Mm -hmm. But your average end user might not think anything of it. Message is from Microsoft Trusted Source. Okay, it's trusted. Good to go with this, right? (laughs) Even if it really was, I would highly recommend never following links. Mm -hmm. Right? If someone sends you something with a link in it, don't follow the link. Don't type the link in. If it's telling you go to YouTube, go to YouTube and search for it. If it's telling you to go to your bank, just go to your bank. Log in and do whatever it is there. Because if it's getting to your email and it's legit, it's also in your bank mail system. So once you get past that, that initial login to your sign-in for your bank, it'll there will be warnings and alerts of things you actually have to do if they're really there. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's not real. Don't follow links and emails. And a lot of people will just turn that functionality off. They will say, we do not allow links in our email system, right? For that very purpose, to try to eliminate that. So this goes on further. It says, Microsoft messages, bounce error notification. Dear Don, Microsoft server is experienced difficulty. Huh. Another weird thing, right? Microsoft server is experienced difficulty. Seeing some grammatical the way it's worded, right? right? I was going to say the, the the ones I received weren't worded, worded correctly either. Yes, so that's a, that's another big red flag. This has not been properly run through. Microsoft would never let this get by, and not not this bad. Maybe something here, something there, but not this poorly. So it's obvious that uh, this uh, English is most likely the Fisher's not not their first language, mm-hmm. right? They have mm-hmm. some familiarity with it, but agree. it's not their first language. But they're experiencing difficulty in delivering most of your incoming message as a result of improper propagation of your domain key error code. Look at them trying to throw some technical jargon in there to really get that user to think this is legit. You can recover your undelivered messages by following the instructions below. Excellent. It's easy to recover your undelivered messages. Just click on view messages, sign in to retrieve your pending messages. In a few minutes, all pending incoming undelivered messages will be retrieved. So they even set the stage for you. This makes me think of a Calvin and Hobbes uh, strip that I read one time. It's one of my favorites. I, I quote it all the time. Calvin gets in trouble at school. He comes home. He's explaining it to his mother and how he told them that uh, the reason he did all these bad things because his mom said he could. <laughs> right? And that she has a te- parent-teacher meeting the next day. Uh, don't worry. I told them to expect you to deny everything. <laughs> <laughs> right? Same idea. If I give you the the expectations that you should see that, oh, your email will come in. Well, guess what? If you log into your email, new email will come in, especially if there's nothing wrong. But they're setting those expectations for you so you think this was legit, nothing comes up, right? And, of course, there's a lovely link right here for us to follow and take us to wherever it's going. Now, when you do have links, a good thing to do, always hover to discover, right? So I'm actually going to zoom in a little bit more. And go down so you can see the link at the bottom. If you look, I'll move over just a little bit. Yeah, a little bit more. There we go. If you look at the very bottom of the screen, you see that this link takes us not to outlook.microsoft.com or outlook.office365.com or anything like that. It takes us to fullmaker.hu forward slash dot OWA. See how they're smuggling in the correct terminology, but they had to do some methodology. Now, we can do this as pen testers. We can follow these procedures, do it better, obviously. Uh, don't use grammatical errors and spelling errors. Um, sometimes you can use like open redirects to make sure that even what we're seeing down here with the link is obfuscated. Mm-hmm. So if we can find some open redirects, that's even better because it's actually looking like it comes from a legitimate site if you do hover to discover. But here we see, obviously, this fullmaker.hu is not Microsoft in any way, shape, or form. You can do your DNS discovery if you were so inclined and have the technical whereabouts to do that. But for us as pen testers, we can learn a lot from this when we're crafting our social engineering uh, attacks 
so that we can do it better, faster, stronger, and get more clicks on those links so that we can gain some credentials. That's what it's all about, credential harvesting. So uh, I'll actually show you how you can do that. Uh, the Social Engineering Toolkit is great for doing this. We'll just whip up a quick little demo here for you, kind of give you a, a basic uh, rundown on how this kind of thing would work. So I'm gonna close this. Let's run over to Kali here. All right, so we just type in uh, SE Toolkit here, Toolkit, like that, and that should fire it off. And it gives us a bunch of different options here. Mm -hmm. I love menu-driven systems such as these. Uh, that's how I typically program my own uh, um, apps like this. So I'm going to do social engineering attacks. So I'm gonna choose one. Then I'm gonna go to website attack vectors, choose two. And here I'm gonna do credential harvester attack method. And what this is gonna do is gonna allow me to basically clone a legitimate site mm -hmm. and then use that site if it has something like a login field to gather those credentials, mm. okay? So I'll hit three and press enter. And now we have a few other options. I have uh, web templates. So if you want to use a template that they already have pre-baked into the SE Toolkit, you can do that. You can do the site cloner or a custom import if you've built up your own um, social engineering type site for this stuff. So I'll go with two here. And now it's asking me what IP address do I wish to use? It's hiding behind my head a little bit. So we'll have to go um, full screen for a second. And you'll see it's just showing my IP address as the server, quote unquote, for this. So I'm gonna hit enter. Now it's asking me to enter the URL that we wish to clone. I'll just go with Facebook. Facebook, not book. There we go. And it is cloning the site. It says unable to clone the specific site. Not a problem, we'll just try again. I'm gonna exit out. I have noticed that the SE Toolkit can be a little temperamental. Mm -hmm. So if you're running the problems, don't get too frustrated. Just exit out of it, try to rerun it again. Uh, and see if it works for you. I, I've had that happen plenty of times. So I'm going to just try it again. SE Toolkit. Fired up. There we go. I'm going to go with number one, social engineering. Number two, website vectors. Number three, credential harvesting. Number two, site cloner. Press enter to choose my IP address and then facebook.com. Okay, now everything looks good because it is running on port 80. It says information will be displayed as it arrives. So let's go back. Let's be a victim. Here we are. I'm on this MacBook. I'm just the average everyday user. I'm going to open up. I don't know why I did that. Um, there we go. But I don't want that. I wanted this. There we go. New private window. So that none of my personal preferences mm -hmm. get in the way of whatever we're doing here. And I'm going to type in... Now we got to we got to we got to set a story. We got we got to tell a narrative here, right? So let, just like what we saw with the email that Don had received, let's pretend that we've received something similar, saying, "Hey, log into Facebook, click this link to do so, check your account." All right, we've clicked that link. Well, instead of taking us to Facebook, that link is going to actually just like what we saw before. If we hover to Discover, it takes us somewhere else. That's somewhere else. Our SE Toolkit site, right? So I'm just going to type it in because I didn't create an email. That's that's a lot of work for just one able to click. We're just going to type it in 10.0. What was it? 12.191, I believe. And look, we're at Facebook. Looks just like it. Or so it seems, right? So I will type in an email. There we go. Bobby at fakeco.com. Sounds good. And then uh, Eagles, there we go. Type in a password. Log in. Hey, must have typed in my password wrong. And then... But if you look here at the top, I'm actually been redirected to the real Facebook.com. So now when I log in, it'll allow me to log in and I'll think, yep, I just, I just fat fingered my password. No problem. Happens all the time. Weird. And I'm none the wiser. But here's the big buts. We go back. You'll notice we've got some information coming through on this thing here. You notice it keeps saying, we've got a hit, we've got a hit. And if you look through here, do a little scrolly scroll. It won't be long because it's printing the output. There we go. I just want to find the top here. And we're just looking for the username and password field. So this is possible username field found. We got a hit. We're just looking for that information which should show the username and password. It's just a lot of info. Let's come back here. 
Well, you know what? We can do this because this is going to be a lot of info to parse through. You go ahead and hit Control C to generate a report. So Control C now it tells you your file is exported to root.set under reports and then right there. So I'm just going to copy that. The whole thing, not, not just part of it. There we go. Hit copy and also open up a new terminal. Make this easy on us. Open that up and I will cat that file. No such file or directory. That's because it's got a weird wrong character in there. Let's try that. And of course it's saying no such file or directory. Well, that's interesting. Why are you saying that? Well, let's try following the breadcrumbs here. .sct reports and 2018.html. There it is right there. Ah, very, very interesting. But now I can grep that information. I don't know why that was not working. Uh, gotta love working with the command line sometimes. So I will grep that. So I'll grep username uh, from that root.sct slash dot set. What was it? Reports 2018. There we go. Reports 2018.html. And it did not find it. Okay, so that grep did not reveal anything. It's weird because there's the term username, but it is in all caps and uh, grep is case sensitive. So that's probably the issue. I'll just uh, see if I can, oh, and if you just look with your eyes, <laughs> it does help. Sometimes I find SE Toolkit to be a little, um, I do like it. I think it works really well most of the time. It is buggy from time to time and I am experiencing that right now. But hey, we we uh, we strive forward, right? And you can see right here, there is the password that we that we gleaned. There is the username that goes with that account. So we are able to gather those pieces of information, all good stuff using the SE toolkit. Like I said, you'll have to kind of play with it from time to time. If it doesn't give you what you're looking for, get out, try it again. Always give these things a couple of shakes before you call it completely no moss, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so there's SE Toolkit. There was working with phishing, traditional phishing campaigns. There are different types of phishing to go along with this. There's spear phishing. There's whaling. There's phishing. There's fish. There, what was it? Smishing. <laughs> there, <laughs> right? Spimming. Spimming, right? <laughs> All sorts of crazy stuff. Let's talk about spear phishing. This is where I target, with a phishing campaign, I target anybody. I cast a wide net. Whoever clicks on it, great. I get some creds. Okay. But with spear phishing, I'm targeting a specific group or mm -hmm. demographic, right? Or um, something like that. Then you go into whaling, where whaling is even more specific targeting, but I'm going after somebody that's in a C level position. Big fish. CEOs, CIOs, CISOs, CFOs, COOs, things of that nature. C level names. That's what I want when I'm whaling, the big fish as Zach mentions. So that's that's what whaling is about. Um, this, and when you're doing whaling, um, you're gonna want to make sure that your language sounds more official, mm -hmm. that you speak to your target so that it seems legit. Otherwise, they're not gonna fall for that stuff at all, okay? Um, you can do this through ways of, I'm, I'm offering you a customer feedback. Uh, we had so-and-so write in and they, I want you to click this link and send them an email or, or uh, take a look at what my findings were. Oh, okay, that makes sense. It's within the context of their business. Uh, business authority, maybe you are a business leader in the industry or a partner with a certain business, you can go after them that way. Pretend to impersonate that person. Legal documentation is always a good way to go because people are scared of lawyers. No one likes to hear the word subpoena in any <laughs> way, shape, or form, usually. So you can uh, whip up a fake subpoena document that's your subpoenaing certain things, and then they give you that information. Uh, also, executive issues, so coming from other C-levels. So that moves us to uh, uh, SMS phishing or smishing, which is where I send an SMS text, which has a link or a phone number to call. At the end of the link is malware or cred harvesting. At the end of the phone number is me, and I'm more than happy to help you. Let's just get connected to your computer and we'll see what the problem is. If you're receiving this message, it's because your computer has a virus and we need to get that cleaned off. 
I'm here to help you, right? That kind of thing. Uh, voice phishing, I call them on the phone. We see this a lot. I love to watch YouTube people like mess with scammers. It's so much fun. If you haven't done that, I highly recommend it. Uh, it could, could have a little bad language or whatever from time to time, but it is super funny to watch somebody with technical skills go up against someone who's preying on those that don't mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and watch them put the hammer down, okay? Uh, but that would be voice phishing. They call people and say, you know, we are a company who helps with these types of issues. We've been informed that your computer has a virus. If you'll follow this link, I'll get connected. I'll help you clean it off, and your day will be great. But it won't be great because I'm a scammer, mm -hmm. right? Farming is where uh, traffic is redirected to a clone site. So maybe I've done some DNS poisoning. So anybody that goes to specific sites that the DNS has been poisoned to will be directed to my clone site that is doing credential harvesting and all the other wonderful bad things we can make them do. Uh, and then spamming is uh, spamming through instant messaging. I try to get you to click a link. You take it. Hopefully you're seeing a pattern at this point in time mm -hmm. on how all these things have a common functionality where it is using that guile and deception to try to get somebody to go somewhere that is meant for malicious purposes, although looking like it's a legitimate source. That being said, uh, Zach, I'm about to lose my voice, and <laughs> we're well out of time for this episode. we got a little bit left for a small part three, yeah. so we'll have to come back for that on another day. Social, social engineering part two, there was a part one, and guess what? There's a part three. So make sure you see our little mini-series in social engineering. You'll be glad you did. Daniel's done a great job, hasn't he? And he's done a great job with all the episodes of CEH V10, so make sure you watch all of them diligently. And by the way, you'll be inside the course library. There's thousands of hours of complimentary information in there. Designed to do one thing, help you be even more successful. So take a look at all that, too. That's everybody you know about IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV is Ben's worthy. Thanks for watching. I'm Zach Memes. And I'm Daniel Lowry. And we will see you soon. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pizzetta. We're coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV, helping you learn everywhere you go. I am your host, Zach Memes, for this episode of CEH V10. This is Social Engineering Part 3. Why? Because we need it. We all need it. And our expert, Daniel Lowry, is here to show us why. Daniel, good to see you, sir. Hey, good to see you, Zach. Glad to be back here in studio uh, with you good folks and Zach as well to finish up our little thing about, well, <laughs> social engineering. We had a good time. We went through a mm -hmm. lot of different uh, topics in parts one and two. We're back to just button things up, make sure we get everything that you need for your CEH exam and some just good practical advice as far as doing social engineering as well, hopefully, anyway. That's right. And when we left off, you'd mentioned vishing yes. and spimming. Correct. But are there any other social engineering attacks that we need to be aware of when it comes to mobile devices? Yeah, uh, there, there actually are. So those are not the only ways in which a mobile device might be targeted by a social engineering campaign of some sorts. Okay? Because they're mobile devices, you got to remember how they get software on them. You know, we download it and, and hit install. I want this. Now, when it comes to mobile devices, they are varied and sundry in, in, in ways that they are or where they come from. So it might be an Apple device, it might be an Android device. Google, I think, has, even though they're based off of Android, you know, it gets, it gets a little weird. But they usually have ways in which you can install software, official ways. Now, Apple, they do a really good job of keeping their, their marketplace. Uh, I'm, I'm not an iOS user, so I can't remember that. <laughs> I think that's what it's called. The it's app. clean, Daniel. Yeah, the, it's uh, clean. The, the store on which you get your apps. <laughs> the App Store. That's what it's called. The, the mm -hmm. Apple App Store. That's where you get it. They do a really good job of curating those applications to keep them safe for you to download and install. There are still ways for you to go. Now, and then there's Google Play, the Play Store, which allows you to install applications for your Android devices. Yes. Right? And, again, they do uh, a very good job. I won't say they do as, as well as um as the app store but they still do a, a good job mm -hmm. okay of keeping malicious software out of those so that you can trust what it is you're downloading on ios get remember that's meant to be a very closed environment it's meant to be very controlled now if you jailbreak your device you can then sideload an app and once you install an app 
that comes from a third party, you're opening yourself up to more malicious possibilities. Yep. So a, a social engineering campaign might work through people that have Apple devices that they have jailbroken and are sideloading applications. Okay. Now, on the Android side of things, it is meant to be an open system. I don't remember if we talked about this or not, so I'm re reiterating just in case. Good. It's meant to be an open system. It's meant for you to be able to install things. They suggest that you only download apps from the Play Store because they're trusted, right? They vet them. But there's nothing stopping you from getting an app from wherever and installing it. So social engineering is primed and ready to go after those as well. And they can do it in a couple of ways. They can create a malicious application. It's just meant to be malicious. Maybe it's got some other functionality to keep it on the down low, right? To keep it hush hush that under the under the hood, it's actually doing malicious things. And you think, oh, I'm just playing this cowboy shooting game or whatever, right? <laughs> I say that. I just came back from a conference, and that, that was the that I was confess. The, yeah, that was the uh, for instance that they gave. Yeah. But are the example. Uh, but there's also a thing so they can repackage an actual app with malware in it, mm -hmm. right? So you take a legitimate application, you reverse engineer it, you inside put malware, bundle it all back up, and it looks like a legitimate application. And then they can get to you. So you're, it's very, very insidious, very sneaky. You do have to be very cautious about what you install, how you install it, where you get it from, whether or not you're rooting a device or jailbreaking devices and installing things from third parties that you may not be aware of their security measures or who they are in general. You might just think, oh, this looks like a cool app. I'm going to install it. You've clicked a link from, you know, spimming or something. Mm -hmm. And you follow it, you install the software, and now you have malware, which is not what you want. Ooh. So, yes, those are a couple of ways in which you could have um, a, a mobile campaign against you, okay? Then there's a licitation, which is uses mobile devices because we're, we're going to elicit information about people from people. We're going to call them. We're going to say, I'm so-and-so. You're going to create some elaborate disguise. Maybe I say elaborate. It doesn't have to be. It just has to be something credible or sneaky enough that they believe that you are who you say you are. I'm calling from your help desk. I'm calling from your credit card company. I'm calling from your bank. And we're trying to help you out. We've had some security issues, and we're trying to be proactive with these things. You notice how I'm, it's all about the delivery. My dad, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. God bless him, he always used to say uh, about my grandfather, he could tell you good morning and you'd want to kick his tail, right? <laughs> because it wasn't what he said, it was how he said it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, a lot of it is in the delivery on how, whether or not these things are going to be um, successful or not. Well, I've been getting one lately. This, this is your card provider. Right. And it sounds totally legit. Yeah. There is a problem. We'd like to talk to you right away. We talked, you, you yes. mentioned that yes. type of thing yes. before. Yeah. Yeah. So when you go and you start trying to do elicitation from people to get information from them about them or about people around them, you targeted them for some specific reason because they have the access you're looking for, the information you're looking for, you have to do it in a way that it will actually be believable and then, of course, you bring in all your motivating factors, right? The fear, the uh, rarity of, or scarcity of, of something, um, authority. Maybe you're acting as an authority. You've built this disguise to help build your credibility and elicit that information that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, there's also something called business email compromise, or BEC, uh, where we're using the email system by spoofing email to garner information typically this is meant to get wire transfers of funds from one person to another and you can do this through email spoofing you can also do it through uh elicitation just call someone up i actually spoke to someone at hack and fest this is what he does he actually it's his job to he works for a financial institution which will remain nameless because i don't know what it is no, <laughs> he, that's good he wouldn't say either but his job is to try to see if he can get branch offices to wire funds to fake accounts, right? And, oh. and to check their own security. He's an internal pen tester. So this is very much something that you might run into as, as, as far as your job goes. So let's, um, let's talk about this really quick. Uh, attacker pretends to be like an executive. So if Zach was my assistant or maybe a middle manager and I'm an executive, I say, 
uh, or Zach, you work for finance. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Let's let's make it really legit. He works in the accounting office. I, as an attacker, assume the identity of one of the executives and saying, we need to send out this transfer immediately. We forgot to make a payment. We owe money, whatever the case is. Please fulfill this funds transfer request ASAP. That kind of thing. Again, I'm using that fear tactic, that urgency of getting things done to try to get Zach to believe I am who I say I am. And my email can look very convincing. Let's jump to the computer. Let's, let's take a look at how this works. I have my attack machine, my Kali machine right here. Over here, we've got this wonderful um, uh, Windows 2012 R2 server with an email service running, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to telnet in, telnet into, what is the IP address of this thing? That's the only thing I don't remember. I think it's 200. Let's look it up. Config. And yeah, 10.0.0.200. All right, so that should help us out. So 10.0.0.200 on port 25, because that's the SMTP service, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. You notice I'm now logged in to that service because that's supposed to be open so people can send email. So uh, all I have to do now is, well, I can do this, help, and say, oh, here are the supported commands for this system. Hey, thanks for the help. I appreciate it. It's very helpful when I type in help and it tells me things I need to know. So I'm going to take this information. I'm going to use it to craft an email to try to get that BEC. Okay. Let's give it a whirl. So first thing I need to do is EHLO. And that basically initiates the system to say, oh, okay, you're ready to send email. Sometimes you have to do an HELO and an EHLO. It just depends on the system. So play around with it a little bit. Try to send yourself some email, see how it works. Or set your own lab up so you can play with it before you try a real uh, social engineering attack, okay? So, uh, but I look good to go here, and now I just need to do mail from, and then tell it who it's from. Now, if we look over in the system, I'll bring up the email, which is called mail enable. This is free, by the way, you guys, if you wanna play with the email like stuff, you can go download this and set up mailboxes. It's pretty, pretty simple and straightforward. But I've got this post office with mailboxes. So there are, my mailbox users. I've got Alice, Billy, Jimmy, and Sally, and then of course the postmaster, which is a built-in account. So I could say, you know, Billy is the account that I'm trying to, and I'll say I'm sending from Sally. Maybe Sally's his boss, and Billy works in finance, okay? So we'll say mail from Sally at, what's the, what did I name this domain here? Let me open the email account, it'll tell me. <laughs> I, I can't remember if I called it CEH or fakeco.com. That's yeah, what I'm yeah, looking fakeco, for. Yeah. Oh, I, I saw that in the headers. I should have I should have noticed that. There's his here's email account, right? Everything looks good. So let's keep going. All right. Yeah, because um I thought I saw it up here. Here it is, fakeco.com. So Sally at fakeco.com. That's who it's from. And it gives me okay. Also, a really good way to enumerate users and email addresses is to actually log into their mail server and try some email accounts and see if they verify. You can use the VRFY. Did that show up? Um, it doesn't show it here, but it probably does it anyway. Uh, VRFY, like that, verify Sally at fakeco.com. And you'll notice I didn't get an error. Mm -mm. So it still works. That lets me also know that this system isn't telling me all the commands when I typed in help. So be, be aware of these. These can be really helpful when you're doing this kind of work. Okay, so now we do receipt from RCPT2, uh, I mean, not from two, and this is gonna go to billy at fakeco.com. There we go, mail action is completed. We are now ready to start crafting our Ooh. email, okay? So we type in data, like the guy from Star Trek, mm -hmm. right? And Everything looks good. We give it a subject, subject, oop, not subjecty. And we'll say send funds immediately. Like so, bing, bing, bing. All right, looks good. I'll say this is from, I like to fill in this from field because that shows up in the header. So if you're looking at, if you're looking at here where, where's Billy's account here? where it says uh, subject and correspondence and stuff. 
that will show up here and look more legitimate. It's more official. Yeah, down down in like these headers and stuff. This is giving me server not found because it's trying to get to the internet, but uh, you'll see it here in just a second. I can actually probably click on that email. There we go. See how it says from mail enable administrator. It has like postmaster. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to fill out. Just gives it that that air of legitimacy, right? So I will say from, and I think I just say Sally at fakenets.com, something like that. Uh, it's been a minute since I've had to do this, so bear with me. All right, so please send $100,000 cash to this uh, transfer. Of course, obviously, you would want this to look more legitimate. I'm just trying to speed up for our time uh, demonstration purposes here. Right. But you would craft this to look very good. Remember, when it comes to social engineering attacks, the things that give it away are poor spelling and grammar mistakes. Mm -hmm. Um, things that don't look legit. You want to follow templates, try to get some email from them if they have some way to elicit email, maybe for the job applications and things of that nature. To get somebody to reply to you so you can see what their email typically looks like. Maybe they have an open way, maybe they have a templated uh, uh, email uh, type of system. So just try to make it look as legit as you possibly can. Okay. To, uh, I'll just say, account number. You know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or whatever. Um, and there we go. And there, that that should be enough. But again, make it look legit. This is yeah, I'm, like, I'm kind of speeding due things to an up here. Accounting error. There's a deficit in this account. Needs to be fulfilled. Blah blah blah. See, Zach gets it. Yeah. <laughs> he understands. That's what you're going for. All right. So I'm gonna hit return. Hit return one more time. And then when you're done, you just end with a period at the end. And it says requested mail action okay completed. Fingers crossed. If I did everything correct. It should deliver that email. I can actually like exit out, I think, or quit. There we go. It should uh, hurry along the sending of it. But there we go. Send funds immediately. Please send 100,000 cash. And you'll notice it's from Sally, fakenet.com. <laughs> right? So if anybody passing by, this has got a bunch of urgency type of, of um, wording in it. It looks like it comes from Sally. He's not going like, to question this stuff. There's no links to involve. He's just going to go in there, and Billy's going to wire transfer some money because Sally told him to, and he's got it right here in writing. Send funds immediately. There's three exclamation points on this. That means this is urgent. And he's this is also it. hypothetical. Yeah. <laughs> so you wouldn't actually do this unless you were hired to do this Correct. by a company to test whether or not Billy would send this. Right. Because we're ethical hackers. That's how we get down. Right. Okay. But that would be it. I mean, that's that's the basics of it right there. You've seen it in action. You'll notice that under correspondence, it shows up as Sally. Everything looks like Sally. Yes, you can drill down. And if you're smart, you know what you're doing and what you're looking for. You can figure out that this did not actually come from Sally. It came from a different machine that's not hers. Uh, through the IP headers and everything that comes uh, with an email address. But the, the damage is already done at that point. The funds have been sent. I'm already in possession of $100,000. I'm having a vacation in Waikiki, and I'm having a great time. Thank you so much, Billy, for not paying attention. Mm -hmm. right? So there we go. And don't click on things. If there's ever a link in an email, don't click on the link in the email. But as a pen tester, boy, you can fill it up with, email, with uh, links. Mm -hmm. So enjoy that. All right, a couple other things that we need to be aware of when it comes to uh, getting information out of people, getting them to do things they shouldn't do. Interrogation. I think we've kind of hinted on this stuff already, yep, so I'll, I'll kind of uh, briefly go through this. Just that questioning of someone. Let me ask you questions about yourself, about your job, about anything that might give me the information that I'm looking for uh, when it comes to a social engineering attack, right? So I might not be targeting Zach directly, but maybe I'm targeting someone that works next to Zach so that I can, by proxy, get information about Zach and he doesn't realize this is happening. But I very well may target Zach uh, directly, okay? Uh, impersonation. Kind of like what we just saw, right? Right. I was impersonating Sally. I have a disguise, but maybe I'm doing it through the phone. I'm doing it through other email types or texting, or maybe I'm connecting with them on uh, Facebook. I, I, I want to say I heard something about that is now illegal to, under false pretenses, Facebook friend somebody. Like that can be a part of like illegal the Ill illegalities. If you under false pretenses, Facebook friend somebody. I thought what you were leading to is pretend to be somebody else on Facebook. Well, that, and that's ultimately what you're doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because if I friend somebody and I'm pretending to be Sally, 
Mm-hmm. I create a Sally Facebook page, mm-hmm. and I Facebook friend Billy to try to get information out of him and get access to or unauthorized access to something. Uh, that will lead to charges against me. I, I, I'm not 100%. Don't quote me on that, but it's just something I heard. I wouldn't doubt it. So let's see here. Uh, good things to pretend to be IT, help desk, right? Because no one questions them. Mm-mm. And a lot of times, help desks and IT are so large, they don't have one-to-one contact with people. They don't know them by name. Things that you can... You can kind of blend in, uh, just depending on the size of the IT or help desk. Let's see. What else can we do? Uh, gather uh, target info for increased ab- availability, or believability, not availability, uh, through their social media sites. We did talk about that. Um, and then get them to perform a task. Hey, I'm with the help desk. We're having a rough day today. We've got a lot of accounts that are acting funky. What we need to do is change your passwords, have you log out and log back in. That would be awesome if you could help us out with that. Oh, no problem. What do you got to do? Well, let me change it. What's your password now so I can change it? Right? Or vice versa. I call and I pretend to be Zach. I need my I need my password changed. Could you help me? Sure. If you're not implementing things like uh, uh, questions, like security questions, I, I've seen it. I have literally watched this happen. Even though they had security questions in place, they would just bypass the security control and not ask the questions. The help desk was just trying to be so helpful that, oh, yeah, no problem. I can change that for you. Mm-hmm. But we had thousands of users. And, yeah, you probably they probably knew a few of them by name. But they know them all. And if they got into the habit of not checking the security question and just changing passwords, and I say, hey, I'm Zach. I'm trying to get, I, I just need to change my password. Can you please change my password? I hate this password. Oh, no problem. Hey, Shane, what would you like it to be? Yeah, uh, Zachy Vengeance 955. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Excellent. It's changed. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. And then I log in. I didn't have to crack passwords. I didn't have to break in through some service. I had the IT team or the help desk person change the password of a legitimate user and gave me access because they didn't do due diligence. So that's what we're testing. That's why we're doing this. Right. That's why right. social right. engineering is a real legitimate and uh, good thing to perform in an engagement. Go for that. See if you can get the client to commit to that mm-hmm. because those are typically the weakest spots in their security. Find those weak links. Right. Is the end user. Zach, that being said, I think we've kind of, we've gone through the, the paces here when it comes to social engineering. I think you guys get the picture by now and uh, we'll call it a day. Fantastic. Social engineering parts one, two, and three. Make sure you watch every one of them. In fact, watch everything in the CEH V10 series that Daniel has worked so hard to put together for you to make sure you can pass that exam. And by the way, if you look inside the course library, there's thousands of hours of complimentary information in there designed to do one thing, help you be even more successful. So check that out as well. And tell everybody you know about IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV is binge worthy. Thanks for watching. I'm Zach Memis. And I'm Daniel Lowry. We will see you soon. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.